I want to welcome you back to the 11th hour today. This is, it's already been a good 11th hour. The Lord gave us some new freedom music and I just really enjoyed that. I enjoyed playing that and I hope you enjoyed listening to it. it it's something that resonates inside every believer especially, but it should resonate inside every human being, period. Because in our DNA, you know, when our founding fathers of this nation wrote the U.S. Constitution and so forth, but when they wrote the Declaration of Independence, that was our freedom statement. And when they wrote that, it wasn't just writing the Declaration, I think, for this nation, but it wrote it for every man, everywhere. And it's in the DNA, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, rights that God gave us, not rights that a government gives. Government don't give rights. Governments are made to protect the God-given rights that are written right here in this book. And so when you hear a sound of freedom, man, your blood ought to jump on the inside of you. You ought to just turn around and look and say, man, there's something to that. That's because when God raised Adam's body up out of that dust and breathed into his nostrils the breath of lives, he breathed freedom into his nostrils. He breathed it into the very marrow of his bones. He stretched himself out on, on the man and put his fingertips on his fingertips, his eyes on his eyes, and his mouth on his mouth. And he raised that body up when he breathed into his nostrils. He breathed what he created into what he made. And that man came up out of that hole of that dirt, and he stood before God with nothing but freedom in his mind. Total liberty. And before God Almighty. And there wasn't any sin to foul it up either. Hallelujah. So today, you know, there wasn't any, not only any sin to foul it up. But I'm going to tell you something Adam didn't think about. He wouldn't have thought about aborting his children. He wouldn't have thought about doing all this stuff. He wouldn't have thought about all these political crap that people do right now. He was told, man, have dominion, subdue. And it was to subdue the evil one that would try to come in his garden. And it was only when Adam failed to do that and just refused and didn't do that and let his wife be deceived. But he was not deceived. She turned to her husband there with her and he did eat. He was standing there the whole time and he knew better. That's why the scripture says in the New Testament that the, ma the woman was deceived, but the man was not deceived. It was only after that that all this evil started. You know, you can tell where it came from. You can tell where it came from. You could tell if a bad odor entered a room, and the only difference is, is this one guy came in. This one person came in. And then when he left, the odor left with him. It's not hard to figure out where that odor came from. All this bad crap that we experience in this world right now, everything that you see, I mean, who, who ever thought of a society that would kill their own unborn? I mean, do you really understand how dark that is? That we would just slaughter our own posterity? What kind of fools does such a thing as that? That's just it. Fools. Bible fools. Well, I, I was deceived into doing it. I understand that. That's what I'm talking about. They've made it look like it's such the right thing to do. But it's not the right thing to do. And some of you uh, women and ladies that's had those abortions later, man, you, you've, I mean, it's just really put you in trauma mode. But I want to tell you something today. I don't care what man deceived you. Adam was not deceived. The woman was. Now, you think about what I'm saying here. Women have, the serpent's still doing the same thing. Oh, it's okay. We're masking under women's rights. He's, he's deceiving, still deceiving Eve, still. But these, well, we'll just we'll move on from here. Okay, we've been talking about spiritual warfare. We started talking about it last week, and I said I was going to pick it up this week, so I are. I'm going to pick it up. Now, in Ephesians chapter 6, you listen to this. It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. 
Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now that's Ephesians 6 and starting in verse 10. Now watch this in verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints." <coughs> So here we're talking about the armor of God, the armor. If there's an armor to be worn, then there's a battle that has been worn in. And God wants you and I to understand. The scripture talks about us being good soldiers and not entangling ourselves with the affairs of this life, being a good soldier in the army of God. We are in a spiritual war. Now, spiritual warfare we'll recap just a little, is as ugly as natural warfare. It's as messy as natural warfare. When you see dictators like Paul Potts, Mussolini, Karl Marx, Lenin, and Hitler, you're witnessing the highest form of spiritual warfare there is. A huge battle took place in the spirit for these demonic beings to take over these men's souls. And it's always a battle for the soul. The soul must be won in combat. The soul must be taken. When the woman was standing at the tree with the serpent, said that what she saw, she saw with her eyes it was good for food, a tree to be desired to make one wise. And she took thereof and did eat and gave to her husband there with her, and he did eat. It's always a battle for the soul. All dictatorships are driven by a demonic entity. And they're always after the soul. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> you know, I remember hearing years ago, and I don't know if I've got this right or not, I mean, how, how exactly how it went, but I remember, I think it was Charles Capps told years ago a story of how your tongue can deceive your heart. Well, deceiving your heart is actually would be like deceiving your soul. Your soul, you can talk about something so long that in your soul, it got deceived somewhere. And a man was, was uh, he always made a joke at his church, you know. He would say, I'll see you next week if I don't get killed by a train before midnight. And everybody just laugh. Because, you know, Satan got the human race buddying with death and joking about death so much. People say, I'm dying to go. I'm afraid not. You know, I'm scared to death. Tickled me to death. I mean, everything's about death. And if he can get you to buddy up with it, he can get it in your soul. Because it's always a battle for the soul. Well, this man said this for years and years. And then one night, he just had this hankering, as we say here in the south to go and get some milk and bread or something at the store. So he gets out and he starts to cross the railroad tracks right before midnight and the lights were out. But there was a train coming and he didn't see it. And as he crossed it right before midnight, a train hit him and killed him. And people would have said, why did God do that? God didn't do that. His tongue deceived his heart until it drew to him. Because it's a living soul. It's a living soul. Now, that's why you need to renew your mind daily to the Word of God. Hallelujah. And the anointing will make up anywhere you lack. But if you're just going to fill your mind with a lot of crap on television and movies and, and just stuff that don't mean a hill of beans... If you're going to watch just a bunch of mess and then wonder why your dreams are so troubled, your soul is being fought for. Your spirit may be born again, but your soul is in in mortal combat for it. I mean, it's a real war for that soul. 
It's always a battle for the soul. All dictatorships are driven by a demonic entity, and there's always after the soul. The demonic spirit always seeks a body to inhabit. This is one thing that drives them constantly. This is, I should say, there is one thing that drives them constantly, and that is occupation. To occupy all that God gave the man. I want to give you two sets of scripture, maybe one more, maybe three this time. I did these two the last time. We're going to maybe add one to that, uh, which is the truth. The scripture is the truth. Now, Genesis 1 and 2, I want you to listen to this closely. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Lord, uh, let's pray. Lord, give us eyes to see and ears to hear that we can learn your word together as a family. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, Genesis 3, I'm going to add this one this week. <clears throat> it says, verse 1, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil." Made them think there was something God withheld from them. Now I want you to listen to this in the New Testament. So it'll be out of the old and new. Mark 5 says, and this starting in verse 7, and <clears throat> cried with a loud voice. This is when Jesus encountered the madman of, we call the madman of Gadara. Said, what have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he, Jesus said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? He answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now you ought to underline all that. Now there was nigh there, uh, nigh, there was there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. You should underline that. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. There were about 2,000. I believe this is real prophetic. And were choked in the sea. The reason it used 2,000. <clears> 2,000. <throat> Now, maybe the Lord will show us more on that in the days to come. I want you to notice the pattern in these scriptures. First, a geographical location. Second, secondary was an animal. And then the third thing, the ultimate goal, was man himself. The spirit will occupy land first, the evil spirit. In Genesis, the earth became without form and void. The earth. In Mark, they begged Jesus not to send them away out of the country, the land. He occupies animals second. Your reference is the serpent we read about and the pigs in Mark 5. Thirdly, an ultimate goal, he occupies men. Out of Genesis, you see Adam fell. You see Cain killed his brother. And then in the New Testament, you see the madman of Gadara. Why? Why would it be land first? Because Adam was made from the land. He was made from the dust. Remember that. Satan is a scientist. He seals up the sum, Ezekiel tells us. He operates in mathematics, equations, numbers, and formulas. He seems to think in threes. Watch now. Land, 
animals, men. One is a stair step to get to the other. St. John 10.10 10 says, The thief cometh not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. One is a stair step to get to the other. I guess, uh, am I going too fast? We, we, everybody good? <clears throat> Chat in, tell me if you're good. Man, we need to, I want everybody. We, I want to go and kick devil butt in these last days. I mean, I want, I, want, I want us all, especially the 11th hour family and partners, I want you to be able just to kick the devil's rear end. <clears throat> Why would he think in threes? Because he knows that God is a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. He also knows that man is a triune being created in the image and the likeness of God, spirit, soul, and body. Three is the number of divine perfection, divine completion, divine perfection, divine perfection. And so this is what Satan wants to be. He wants to be divine. So when he comes after lands first, this is why you see the dictators, Hitler, uh, Mussolini, Paul Potts, uh, even go on back, Nimrod, Nero. You see all these wicked leaders. It's because that has to do uh, with nations. Land would have to do with nations. He wants the nations. And this would include, uh, I should say the land is the nation's World wars, he has always start a war. Why? Because wars include men. Now, I want you to notice, he comes after the land, the nations. He's trying to get to the men, dictators, things like that. Now, <clears throat> he always wants access to men. So he goes to, wants the land, the nations, and, and so forth. Then he moves into the animal world. Well, we see that, the serpent. And in modern time, we see COVID. And it's akin to snake venom, serpent. So this is now, how does he get access to men through that? Injections, death, or transformation. All to bring in the seed of the serpent. Land first because Adam was created out of it. Next, animals because they have a right to be here and to be in the land. In flesh and blood. But notice he was making his way to the man. First thing the demons asked Jesus, don't send us out of the country. Once the land is occupied, then animals can be occupied. Once this happens, they have access to flesh and blood because these animals can now interact with a man. You think about it. Just like Eve in the garden and the pigs with the herdsmen in Gadara. It's a good piece of information to know in spiritual warfare. Now, Let's get into something new today on this. And I want to say this statement, destiny is always a factor. Destiny is always a factor. That's a big word, destiny. Destiny includes, that's the, the bright light, God, the plan he had for you from the very conception. Even before you were conceived, he knew you and had a plan for you. If a man reaches his destiny, then Satan will reach his. If man reaches his destiny, then Satan will reach his, which is eternal hell. The destiny of a man is like a bright and shining, beautiful light that God has created. He created one for every man, each as unique as the man's fingerprints. Satan squints at that. Because it hurts his eyes to even try to look at it. He don't understand what your destiny is. But he knows that bright light, that destiny that God has got out ahead of you. He don't know exactly what it is, but he knows there's enough revelation in it. And there's enough resurrection power in it that he can't possibly ever deal with it. Therefore, he must keep you out of it. 
at all cost. And see, so we, we start to hear uh, the battle's always for the soul. You know, we, we always, you'll hear me say things like, because to me, see, things that are on the road of sin are just roadblocks to keep people from their destiny. They're to detour them. But he has to come after the souls. Like, I, I believe that, that we have a vast army in the born again, uh, uh, for the born again body of Christ it's in this army, a vast army of evangelists in the homosexual communities. I believe that. That's why I make a pull for them so much because I recognize anointing on them. I recognize the anointing. Satan can't invent anointing. All he can do is pervert anointing. And it takes the soul of a person. That's why you see that community so activated. So they're evangelists to spread their message. Well, they will spread a message, but it will never get them to their destiny. Not the one God had for them. He said, I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you and give you an expected end. But if you think about it, if it's just that message, there is no heritage of the Lord being born. If everybody believed that way, it would just the human race would stop. And I see such a great future. It's like in, in the late 60s and or middle 60s, early 70s, when the Jesus revolution came. It was all drugs in the psychedelic world and all of that and experimental drugs. And it was, there was a vast army of the, for the body of Christ out there, of prophets and things like that. And the Jesus revolution was a reach for those people. Well, in this new Jesus revolution, it's that LGBTQ community out there. The people are, are precious. The LGBTQ is a political entity that's just using people, and they don't care about them. It's just like BLM. It's a, it's a political entity. They don't care about people. They're Marxist, even by their own admission. Now, the battle is always for the soul. Even in nations, it's a battle for the soul. I want you to notice on the podium of Joe Biden, there was a sign on the front of it that read, Battle for the Soul of the Nation. This is spiritual talk. This is not natural talk. When you start using words like battle for the soul of a nation, you're not talking about physical things. You're talking about the mediator between the body and the spirit. It's the soul. You're talking about a battle to control someone's destiny, their spirit, and drive their body wherever you want it to go. Whoever sits in the seat of the soul and controls that, controls the whole man and his whole life. And in a nation, it's the same way. Occupy the man's soul and you will keep them from their destiny. Abortion. If you kill a, a, a a person, uh, if you abort a person or kill them, you take away all they are and all they ever will be. I heard that said one time on a movie. I thought, man, you know, that's the truth. You kill a person, you take away everything they are and everything they ever will be. But that's certainly true when you abort a child. You take away all they are and all they ever will be. And that bright light of their destiny sets out there on a hill and there's no one to head to it. Satan belly laughs at that. That's why there'll be Satanists come into abortion clinics and, and some of them will, uh, they even say they'll pay to come in and do rituals while they're aborting a blood child. Well, it doesn't make any difference what you think you're doing. God got that baby. And all of you ladies that have had abortions, you can see your baby again one day. Hallelujah. And that baby holds no malice against you. 
just simply say, Lord Jesus, forgive me, cleanse me of that, and I want to I want to meet my child again in heaven. And you will one day, and you'll get to, if they're still little when you get there, you'll raise them. And if you get there and they've grown up some, they'll call you mama. <clears throat> Hallelujah. You take away, if you abort one, you take away all they are and all they ever will be. Their destiny is never seen. Only when this spiritual fight is over, and righteousness once again reigns in our government. Will it be seen just how much it cost? Only when the last demented mind that relishes in the death and slaughter of the unborn is voted out of office will the heaviness of what they caused be clearly seen. Only when those who sell America out to the highest bidder are voted out of office will it be seen just who the enemies of freedom really were. Oh, it's a fight. It's a fight to keep going. I'm speaking about a Christian too or a Christian right now. It's a fight to keep going when you are attacked on every side. When you see Christian brothers and sisters so blinded by ambition and self-centeredness until they would rather hate those standing for the righteousness than to stand with them. When this facade of illusion is finally ripped away and it is clearly seen who was really running things, then at least righteousness can be agreed on by the body of Christ. Physically, mentally, spiritually, it is taxing. But God will not abandon us if we will but stand on his word and refuse to be moved. Hallelujah. Divine intervention has begun and God will speak to men on their beds if necessary. But righteousness will reign in America again. Hallelujah. It's like Thomas Paine wrote. Thomas Paine of old. The American crisis, he wrote. It is truly the time that tries men's souls. But Ecclesiastes declares there is a time and a season for every purpose under heaven. At this time, it's not with musket and ball the war's fought. In this day, it is fought with words, pen, and social influence. We must speak up and speak out. The word of the living God, we must boldly talk of what's right so much and so loud that when we vote righteousness, it will be in such massive numbers that dishonesty of vote cannot even be considered and they would look foolish to even try it. I hope somebody's getting all this out there today. As Christians, we must be vocal about the atrocity of abortion. We now have 4D ultrasounds. So there's no denying that it's a baby. Now with the proof of 4D, proof like this, it is clearly murder of the innocent. When righteousness begins to be the order of our great republic again, truly we will see life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness actually become achievable again. And it will become a pleasure to wake up every day again and know heaven is smiling on our great nation. Then one day you can tell your children of a time when ungodly people tried to steal the godly principles America was founded on. When the founders of our great nation heard from God and established us on biblical-based republic of godly principles and laws. Nations are tied to destinies. 
Now, let me say something about that. Destiny includes the word destination. Nation, which includes a land and a people. So destiny has a destination, and the nation includes land and people. To change the course of a nation and turn it away from God is to turn people from their God-ordained destiny and give, give it and the people in it a man-made selfish destiny, not of freedom nor self-governance, but bondage and submission to government. So we've been talking about spiritual warfare today. And these are just some things. We may do more about it, but these are, if you take last week and this week, you begin to see some things about spiritual warfare. And spiritual warfare is the highest form of battle. It's the highest form of warfare. God sends warnings a lot. He sends things a lot into the earth so that people can't miss them. But if you, if you don't even believe in the prophetic and you don't believe in prophets, no wonder the body of Christ never saw all this seed of the serpent coming in 2020. No wonder we never saw it. Because they wouldn't let prophets speak. They branded prophets as crazy people. They branded prophets as people who just, well, you know how. They're just flaky. And all they had, the, and, and apostles, <clears throat> all they say apostles are is just missionaries for the most part. It's so much more than that. But if you take away apostle and prophet, you only have a three-fingered hand of God. You have an evangelist, a pastor, and a teacher. And if you are really prepared to say that's the only three that exist, then you, my friend, if you're in one of those categories and you, and you said, well, you know, uh, uh, I'm a pastor, and a pastor's an evangelist and teachers, that's all they are. And you're a pastor and you say there, there is no prophet, it only exists in these three offices, then you you utterly failed the United States of America in righteousness. You utterly failed the world in righteousness because look at the crap that's happened. Because deliverance and preservation comes through the mantle of a prophet, Hosea says. It says by a prophet they were delivered and by a prophet they were uh, preserved. It's the prophet's mantle that is an officer from the court of heaven that came and pointed his finger at a king like David. Even a king after God's own heart. He committed the sin with Bathsheba, had Uriah killed, and the prophet looked at him and said, Thou art the man. And God sent the court of Jehovah into the earth and tried the king. That comes through the mantle of a prophet, not a pastor. Not an evangelist and not a teacher. Now the whole body of Christ can be prophetic because you have three anointings in you, prophet, priest, and king. That don't mean you wear the mantle of a prophet. That don't mean that you, have, you, you may have the mantle of a pastor, the mantle of an evangelist, the mantle of a teacher, a mantle of an apostle, but that don't mean you're a prophet. We find the apostle Paul with the mantle of, a, of an apostle being spoke to and prophesied to by a prophet named Agabus. And Paul didn't say, wait a minute now, hold on, I'm the apostle here. Oh, no, he listened to every word Agabus said because it was the same Agabus that prophesied the, the drought that was coming before that time, and it came. And Paul had a, more than one prophet. It said prophets came up, came up and went with him and was there with him. That's what we have. See, we see people getting around the president. You talk about like, and I'm talking about the president, Donald Trump. You stop people get around him. I remember when when the the he 
became president, when he was running for president, and you see all these religious leaders around him, like 30 of them, and they're laying hands on him, and they're talking to him, and they're prophesying over him. And as soon as that farce happened in 2020, that it don't take anything but just horse sense to realize that something crooked happened, that it was stolen. And so there's just common sense. You can't expect somebody who don't draw 300 people to a parking lot and wears a mask, lives in a basement to beat somebody who's holding five rallies a day, 25,000 people per. I mean, it don't take a lot of sense to figure that. It don't even take a profit to show you that. You look at that and say, well, my God, man, something's wrong here. Hey, they're going to be mad at you now, brother. Right now, already mad as hell at me. I don't care. I don't care. I'm not taking the care of that. My job is to tell the truth, and I'm going to tell the truth. And the truth is this book right here. But I watched all these religious leaders get around Trump. They did good. They prayed over him. They prophesied over him and everything else. But as soon as that mess happened, I didn't see them no more. I thought, where did you go? What a witness to the man that all of a sudden he's abandoned. It's because through the scripture, it's not pastors, evangelists, and teachers that surround a king. It's prophets. Prophets. You know, the new world order they're trying to bring in with Klaus Schwab and his cat. What, you don't have one, but it looks like that on that James Bond movie. And there he is, but you've got somebody that's tied to him. You've all know a Harari. They call him the prophet. Isn't it amazing how the New World Order can call somebody a prophet and the church say, there ain't no such thing as prophet. And so here we are. Prophets go in and, and speak to kings. Not evangelists, not pastors, not teachers. Now a king needs a pastor. And he can probably get his spirit built up big listening to an evangelist and be taught how the office of all of them, even a prophet, works by a teacher. But when it comes to hearing from heaven, it's always the prophet that stands in front of a king. And in Revelation 11, it's two prophets that keep the beast in the bottomless pit. Don't let him have any power until their testimony's finished. And then when he kills them and, and, and everybody thinks, the Bible said the world will celebrate because two prophets died. Isn't that something? I know churches right now, well, I don't know them. Surely to God, I don't know them. But there are people that act like they'd be glad if they could see, and Christians, if they could see prophets die now. But there's one thing about, why is it? Well, in Revelation 11, when that time comes, fire comes out of their mouth and consumes anyone who would stand against their prophecy. And powers turned up in the prophets by Revelation 11 so strong. It said they can call fire down out of heaven and they can turn water to blood at will. Oh, my goodness, man, we never seen that kind of power. That's Old Testament stuff. That's Red Sea stuff right there. People say, well, why is there so much confusion over two presidents? Well, it's the time of the Biden. It's the time of the by, the two. It means two. I remember when, uh, and you know, Kim Clement gave a prophecy, or Kim Clement gave a prophecy years ago, said there will come a time when there will be a time of two presidents. And I remember him saying something to this effect. Does that sound strange? Well, it don't sound so strange no more, does it? And you see an all-out war for the soul, for the soul. I heard a Republican say the other day, a Republican but Donald Trump will probably go to jail, but it'll be after the elections. They're already planning it. 
man, with friends, Republican friends like that, who needs a devil? So, spiritual warfare is always a battle for the soul. And God sends signs into the earth. You know, um, it was Thanksgiving, I think. We had a, a, our family and, and some people that, that are family and ministry and so forth. And we were all enjoying the day together. And we'd put up the Christmas tree. And we have this tree in this certain place. It's 14 feet high. And I don't know if it's maybe 10 feet around. Huge, huge tree. I mean, I walked in and went, whoa, this tree's big. Well, we're sitting there and everybody's enjoying the, the evening. And we never go. If you're in a gathering with any of us anywhere, you don't go if 30 minutes passes in Jesus or something about the scriptures not discussed, it would surprise me. Because, you know, we, people like they asked Smith Wigglesworth, they said, Do you ever, how long do you pray at one time? Do you pray 30 minutes at a time? He said, No, I can't remember when I've ever prayed 30 minutes at a time. He said, But I can't remember a time that I've ever went 30 minutes without praying. Because you stay in a constant flow with God. I don't want out. That's my life. That's what I want. I'm, I'm, I want to hear him. I sleep with, with my notebook. I, I, I Constantly, I want to hear him. I want to write it down. I ask him, speak to me in the night, Lord. And there's things in here he spoke. I don't know if he'll let me tell them today, but they're prophecies. He told me of the war in Israel that was coming. I wrote about that months before it happened. Said I heard the sound of tanks rolling up on the borders of Israel and so forth, and and was talking about them. And and then I remember when we went to Israel, prophesying on Mount Carmel, prophesying on Masada, prophesying in Shiloh, prophesying in Jerusalem, prophesying uh, about peace and 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 the enemies of Israel being stopped, and nobody could understand why, including me. Why are you prophesying that? There's no war. It's perfect peace over here. It's good peace. And it was. It was a great time. But, buddy, it wasn't two months. You see what took place. And now, and remember I stood on Masada, and, and whoever, Robin was with me, and I stood there, and, and Amber was there, and I stood there and said, held my, my staff out, and I said, call for the weather to fight for Israel. Buddy, it's done it. And I said, I call for, I said, we're including rain in that. And buddy, I mean, it started during this war, flooding tunnels, doing this. And I was talking about birds of prey, birds of prey. And Hamas flew in with their paragliders. I thought I was talking about drones. It goes to show you that when a word from the Lord comes, and then I stood over and stretched my staff toward the Mediterranean from the top of Carmel, Mount Carmel, and started prophesying over that the sea would fight for Israel and so forth. And now we've seen where American warships, uh, aircraft carriers and British carriers and all these superpowers come into the Mediterranean. We had no idea. But God knew what was happening and a, and a he sent a prophet to Israel. I, I know there's more than me. I mean, I got enough sense to know that. Are you crazy? But all I can talk for is this ministry. I can't speak for other people's ministries. The Lord told me about the sickness that came in 2020, told me in 2016. And I said it. And it's recorded. Told me again in 19. I said it. Well, it came. So we're sitting over there in this big old giant tree sitting there. And we're just sitting there. Everybody's laughing. And all at once, Krista's eyes got big. Wasn't it you that looked over at it? She looked at it, and it just started shaking. And then it just started falling. I mean, this giant, it looked like, I mean, we're talking about a tree that looks like a lumberjack would take down, you know, in a house. This thing is huge. And people was hollering, my God, look out, whoa, my God, here it comes. Whoa, boom, it hit the ground. Didn't hit really nobody, just hit the ground, hit the floor. 
I'm looking at it. Of course, I'm, everything's prophetic to me. I'm thinking, dear God, what does this mean? I thought, oh, my God, what is happening here? I mean, this happened in, in, in a place the ministry owns. What happened here? Well, it wasn't but about a week later, maybe a week. I don't know how long it was. That big tree on the White House lawn just fell. Boom. And the Lord was showing us what was coming. He was showing us what was coming. And I heard the Lord say these words, Joe Biden and this administration, you've offended heaven. You have offended heaven with all that you do and all that you're doing. And heaven has taken notice that the birth of Jesus has been slammed and Jesus has been pushed aside in the earth. Heaven has noticed. Take notice that heaven has noticed. For it has. Angels are moving. Things are happening. And now you have your nose stuck in Israel's business. Heaven has noticed. For the offense against Jesus in the earth by all the groups and entities, not just that one in Washington, has been noticed. There is only one God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the only Savior. Jesus is the only Savior. He is Mashiach, the Messiah, Yeshua, HaMashiach, the Messiah. There's only one. He was in the beginning with God. His name was Word. And St. John 1, 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelled among men. We beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father. He is the only Savior. There is no other. Keep this in your minds. Let it mull over in your hearts. There's only one. and There'll never be another. And I heard the word of the Lord talk about those handlers that have handled Joe Biden. And you've mistreated the old man. And you have disrespected. And you push him around and gaslight his world. Heaven has noticed you. Heaven has noticed you. Remember. Remember. So prophetic signs and prophetic waves and symbols in the earth come into the earth and God shows things. Is there repentance? Ask. Ask and see. For if you have a desire to ask, then there is for you. For thee. For Satan seeks to think he can rule this nation and this world at this time and this juncture. The Lord said, Nay, he cannot rule this world at this time. And some that you thought would be in power in a global scale beyond this nation will not make it into that power. For I heard the Lord say, I'm going to breathe into Joe Biden's mind and I'm going to give him clarity of thought to make a decision of clarity and of right. Do this right and you will be a hero, says the Lord. 
do it wrong. And that's the way it will be remembered. Hallelujah. Well, Brother Robin, that's, you know, you're just talking pretty bold and pretty strong. I know that's just what it seems to come out as every time. But you know what? I'm not mad or angry at anybody. But what could gripe you more than anything is Christian people that's supposed to know better, that just attack prophets and attack people. These kind of things can really cause an aggravation in the spirit. You see people that are not prophets judge prophets. What did you come out to see? What did the nations of the world come out to see in prophets? What did churches come out to see? Reeds shaken in the wind? Is that what they came to look at? Who are you to slide a piece of paper across a table, so to speak? Christian leaders I'm talking about. Slide a piece of paper across a table and tell a prophet, sign that that you'll be accountable to us for your prophecies before you give them. Could you imagine sliding that paper over to Elijah? And saying, Elijah, sign that. That you're going to run all your prophecies through us. Or Elisha or Moses. Let's try that with Moses. Moses might not only not sign, he wouldn't only not sign your petition, but he might drag you across the table. So we look at things like that, and people say, well, 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 now don't you listen close to me. I'm, I'm talking about the church. You ever notice a prophet will talk about political things, leaders of political parties. Suddenly they'll start talking about the church. They'll start talking because God has a word for everybody, and it all includes mercy. Well, you don't look like you're talking in love. Well, believe me, I am. If I was mad, you'd know it. I don't like to do that. I, I'm just, this is not mad. This is, well, not crazy. This is not angry. <laughs> because I'm, I'm like the Lord on these things. I wish everybody would repent. Now, but I've got to tell you what I was going to tell you now. I pray that it comes right back to me. But people... They want to control what a prophet says or judge what a prophet is, and they're not one themselves. And so, and people say, well, you got to because you got to have a covering. And then I want to say this. Would you just educate us and show us this in the Scripture? Wear a covering, you have to have a covering of a man. Would you, would you show me the way they say, oh, you know, you got to be a covering under the assembly of God, under the Baptist church, under the church of God. You got to have a covering. Would, would you please just show us, show me that? Because the Bible's very, very definitive about that. You know, you know how, how real clear it is about it? Because it says nothing. That's some man invented all of this. The word of God, man didn't, it was inspired by every scripture was the breath of God. The only coverings you can find, got to have a covering. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's a call from God that's passed down. Well, I gotta have a cover. Man, we was laughing in here. It was it was light in here, and then all of a sudden it's so heavy, I can feel the air. 
And, but anyway, anyway, that's what the Lord said to say today, so I said it. Hallelujah. Well, today on the 11th hour, I want to, um, we want to get Krista to come up, receive the offering. Roxanne may have some praise reports today. And I, somebody chat in and let me hear from you around the world. You know, I hadn't, I hadn't asked that in a long time. But I like to hear from people. I like to hear what they're doing, what's being said. They say, you know, somebody rode around my house the other night screaming, false prophet, false prophet. It sounded like Mr. Haney on Green Acres, false prophet or something. I don't know, just riding around screaming and don't even know what a prophet is. Is there prophets nowadays, Brother Robin? Yes, there is. Is there apostles? Absolutely. Are there pastors? Yes. Are there evangelists? Yes. Are there teachers? Yes. The teacher, the little finger, cleans out the ears where you can get down in it and hear. The ring finger, the pastor, married to the church. The longest, the middle finger, is longer than the other four and goes between them all, the evangelist. The index finger, the prophet, points the way. Thus saith the Lord. The thumb, the apostle, the only one of the others that can touch all the other four. Hallelujah. So there is a five-fold ministry of the hand of God. When you walked into the tabernacle of Moses, the first covered tabernacle you walked in through from the outer court was held up by five posts, represented the five-fold ministry. And when you walk in through there, then you're in there in the school of God where the menorah, the seven-branch candlestick burns with revelation, the table of showbread and the bread of his presence. And, and you, you're in there with, with the, the altar of incense that burns with the red coals, the heart of God. And so the fivefold ministry is supposed to allow you access into the things of God where you can be in his presence, see all of his revelations, complete seven, and see the heart of God and how it burns. And then from there, you're prepared to go behind the last veil and sit with him in heavenly places. Hallelujah. It's good stuff, huh? All right. Krista, come and take the mic and just... Teach us. Hallelujah. So anyway, <laughs> it's offering time here on the 11th hour. Today, if you would like to sow and join in with us in, in this corporate time of worship, you can do so by going to robindbullock.com. Follow the ways to give on the screen. And then if you're going to the website, you can just go up to the top of the screen, hit the three little tabs at the top, and follow the instructions from there. You know, Sunday at Church International, I begin talking about... Uh, Someone's knocking on the door. Somebody's ringing the bell. And, you know, that song by Paul McCartney and Wings, Let Them In. And uh, I began talking about what I had heard from Brother Jesse about Peter when he was released from prison. And how when he was released, he went to the house and he began to knock on the door. And the people who had been praying for him praying without ceasing when they heard the knock on the door and I'm sure I'm sure they said who is it or something like that I, I'm sure and they heard Peter's voice they took off running and went the other way <laughs> just went the other way and instead of opening the door and letting Peter in they just left they just ran away they got scared and, and ran away and uh, But the part that is really the main part of that entire scripture is the fact that Peter kept knocking. He kept knocking on the door. The scripture says he continued to knock. The scripture also says in Matthew 
seven seven in the amplified version and we've heard this several times it says ask you know and it will be given to you seek and you will find knock and the door will be open but in the amplified version it says ask and keep on asking and it will be given to you seek and keep on seeking and you will find knock and keep on knocking and the door will be open to you and it says for everyone going into verse 8 for everyone who keeps on asking receives and he who keeps on seeking finds and to him who keeps on knocking it will be opened now when the bible says it will something will happen it's going to happen go ahead and just mark that down if jesus says surely I say unto you, well, it's going to happen. It's just going to happen. And did you know that all those words that I just read right there are words in red? Which means guess who's talking? Jesus is talking. And he said, if you'll keep on doing this. See, we have such, and you know, speaking of, of this nation, this, this great nation that, that we live in, uh, which will forever be one nation under God. But the people that <laughs> live in this nation, we are, we're very, we're very spoiled. We're, we're very um, accustomed to getting, getting things, have, having it our way. We have a Burger King mentality of having it our way. We have an Amazon mentality of we want everything in two days. We want everything done immediately. We have a fast food. You know, Jesse says, we, I mean, we're the ones who invented fast food. And, you know, it's not really food anyways. But we're the ones where we want it our way. We want it fast. We, we want our money and we want it now. You know, that kind of sums up the entire, the entire mentality of just about, 95% of everybody that lives in America is we want it and we want it now. Because you go to other countries and things don't happen that fast. You go to other countries and, and contrary to popular belief, they actually work. They, they, have, they have a working mentality. And that's the way that our founding fathers of this nation intended on us to be. They intended on us to work. To believe God, but also work. And, but somewhere along the way, just like we forgot the other values that the founding fathers had, we forgot that too. And we forgot that we're co-laborers with God. We forgot that he does his part on his side. And he is true to his word. He is not a man that he should lie. But we forgot that we're supposed to do our part also. And so we knock one time and when somebody doesn't come to the door, well, we just turn around and leave. And we say, oh, okay, well, we'll go somewhere else. That's not the way, that's not what the scripture says. It says, if you ask and you keep on asking, well, then you'll receive. You seek and you keep on seeking. How many times have you looked for something in your house and you have found it the very first time you looked? That, that usually, that, that is, well, especially, no offense to the male race out there. <laughs> But y'all don't find things the first time you look. We'll be like, it's right here. No, it's not. It wasn't there. Well, where did it go? <laughs> because it was literally there last night. Well, did you look here? No, I didn't look there. No, I looked right here. But then the women come right behind you. Now, I believe that women find things more the first time they look than men. Our percentage is a tad bit higher, especially have you ever seen your mom dig in her purse that is absolutely disorganized completely and totally, and she'll pull it out the very first time? I, I mean, how many times have you seen that happen? You'll just be like, and I'll, 
as a woman, I can't look in another woman's purse and find what she needs. But I can look in my own and, and pull it out. And so, and a man could probably dump it out and still couldn't find it. And said so we had to lighten it up. Things were getting heavy. But, and it has been a heavy 11th hour, but it's been a good 11th hour. But if you keep on looking for what you're looking for, you keep on seeking. You know, it didn't, Indiana Jones did not find what he needed the, the minute he walked out his door. He went through all kinds of stuff to find it. Yeah, he didn't just go out. To, he had, I mean, I remember them snakes in that one movie. And I fast forward that part because I can't stand it. I just can't stand it. But he went through a lot to find what he was looking for. You have to keep on seeking. You have to keep on asking. And you've got to keep on knocking. Because if you'll continue knocking, you'll keep on knocking. All of a sudden, something goes off in heaven. And they go, somebody's knocking at the door. Somebody's ringing the bell. And they'll be like, and who is it? And they'll open the door and it'll be you standing there. And they'll be like, well, what you need? And then you make your request known. You make your request known and then you get what you've been asking for. You get what you've been seeking. And what knocks on the door? Faith. Faith keeps on knocking. Faith keeps on knocking no matter what your bank account says. Faith keeps on knocking. No matter what your, your, your boss said at your job. No matter if it was you that got cut. Faith keeps on knocking at the door. No matter, and that's for somebody out there who has, who has found themselves in a position where it was an unexpected loss of your job. Faith keeps on knocking at the door. Because it is not God's will that you stay unemployed. It is not not God's will that you stay in poverty. It is not God's will. He wishes above all things that you prosper and that you be in health even as your soul prospers. Faith doesn't look at the circumstances outside. Faith does not look at what's going on around. Faith looks at this word right here and takes it and continues to knock and continues to knock until that door opens. I'm telling you, I've watched doors open that looked absolutely impossible possible but faith kept on knocking until that door actually opened but you've got to remember you've got a part to play in this too God's not in the poof ministry. He doesn't just do things just like this in your life. Jesus doesn't just walk around just going there it is. There it is. There it is. Could he do that? Absolutely he could if he wanted to but you've got a part to play in this we're co laborers The scripture does not, it, it, it wouldn't have put that in there if it didn't mean that. This, this book right here don't throw words around. Everything put in here is strategic. And it means what it said, which means you do your part, God will surely do his. And that's the beauty of it, is when you do yours, you can just count on God that he is going to back his word up. So keep on knocking. Today is your giving, and you've been naming that seed. You know, and I'll close with this. I'll never forget when my mom kept on sowing the seed for the house that I was raised in, the house that, that I grew up in. And she, we lived in a mobile home at that time. And, and she just kept, kept sowing. She named her seed. She kept sowing for the house until one day, she heard the voice of the Lord say, that's seed enough. So what did she do? What got us that house that I grew up in? She kept on knocking. She kept on knocking. She kept on asking. She kept on sowing. And so today, you, if you're continuing to sow that seed, you're continuing, one day you'll hear, that's seed enough. And your heaven will open that door and say, what, what you need? Is, is this the house that you need? Is this the car you need? 
And it, that applies to every aspect of your life, not just financial. So today, keep on knocking, my friends. Keep on sowing. Keep on asking. Keep on seeking because the scripture says that if you'll do that, then you will receive. And so today, <clears throat> we're going to keep on knocking with our giving. Today, with Luke 6, 38, it says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. You say, I believe it, I receive it, and I call it done in Jesus' name. Now for the tither, and just like I said Sunday, you know how tithing ain't just about money? Because God never raised the rate. It's still 10%. It has been since it was first put in this book, and it still is today. The tithe is not just about money. The tithe is about rebuking the devourer for your sake. Why do you think that the devil wants to mask the tithe and he wants to put such a bad stigma on the tithe? Why? Because it's about rebuking him for your sake and the Lord rebukes him and that scares him out of whatever mind he has left. Malachi 3.10, say it with me. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it and I will rebuke the devourer for your sake and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field saith the Lord of hosts and all nations shall call you blessed for you shall be a delightsome land saith the Lord of hosts say I believe it I receive it and I call it done in Jesus name amen so be it Roxanne come on victory reports with Roxanne hallelujah yeah, that happened to me yesterday, uh, talking about gentlemen that can't find anything on the first try. Yeah, and my son had lost all his switch games, and I told him, I said, go look in your backpack. I did. They're not there. I said, look in the front part of your backpack. I did. They're not there. He brought me his backpack. I reached in the bottom, pulled the whole pocket out that had his all his cartridges, his games in it. And I said, see, son, I told you it was there. So that's actually really accurate, even with a five-year-old. So well, I hope you all are having a wonderful Tuesday. We've already had an amazing 11th hour. We had a lot of praise reports come in this week um, that came off the, uh, uh, the wave of our healing service that we had at the end of November. So I wanted to read uh, a few of these. I couldn't read them all because we did have pages and pages of them. So I just wanted to, to touch on some of them. This first one, though, uh, it says, this is a praise report. I attended Sunday service in October 2022, and during the offering, I gave $50. Finances have been very tight, but I felt led to give $50. $50. Two weeks later, I was visiting a relative who is 90 years old and a non-believer and someone who I've had a very bad relationship with in the past. I visited him for a few days, and on my way to the airport, he stopped by my room and handed me $500. It's a huge surprise. He's never given me any cash before, and this was a miracle from the Lord, $50 turning into 500 Yes, and he also said his wife separately handed me $500 on my way out to buy, me some, or to buy something for my children. So $1,000. He got the, uh, $500 from the man and $500 for his, from his wife. So um, that was amazing. So praise the Lord. Also, let's see, there was one back here I wanted to read you guys uh, let's see yes this says I'm a partner of Church International tied to the church and uh, am a member of the church from here in Wisconsin I watch every Sunday and always feel blessed by TI's ministry this week I watched the Sunday service which was our healing service on 11 19 uh, but she was watching it on Monday the 20th I've had trouble with pain in my left hip and my knees, and during the healing service, uh, Pastor Robin, I was suddenly moved to tears as they were singing hallelujah with hands raised, and I kept repeating, Jesus, you live inside of me, and you were never crippled, so neither am I. 
Lots of tears and singing later, I got up and walked pain-free. I'm holding on to my healing and thanking Jesus for your ministry. She says, God bless you all at CI for your services, uh, all your messages, ministering, and music. You've changed my life for the better in these trying times of spiritual warfare. Thank you for all you do. So praise God for her healing as well. There was one that said, I've been battling a headache since February this year, uh, day and night, that has never went away. And during the healing service, my headache went away, and I haven't had it since. So praise the Lord for that. Also, we had one that says, um, after my husband had been ill for quite some time, we have seen a few doctors and had several tests. On October 22nd, new blood work was ordered, and the results came back with antibodies in three of the tests for lupus. We were devastated, and I immediately prayed, contacted CI prayer requests online, and we were referred to a rheumatologist specialist. On November 22nd, we had our appointment. The doctor examined my husband and ordered more blood work to confirm. After we waited patiently over Thanksgiving weekend for the results, we got a call yesterday. There are no antibodies in his blood for lupus or any other type of disorder. Everything came back negative. So praise the Lord. She says, thank you so much for your prayers and your ministry. So thank you, Jesus, for all of the healings. We'll read some more of these next week as well. Send in your praise report. Send them to robindbullock.com. Click the contact form where it says prayer requests. You can put your victory reports there. Call us. Let us know what God's doing in your life so that we can rejoice with you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. That is awesome. Victory reports. You know, I want to welcome everybody and all the other nations that are watching today. They just showed me some of those that are watching. And uh, all the United States, all 50 states, and, and uh, so many nations. I think I just saw 11 nations. And uh, so we are very honored that you'd be with us today. You know, I, I, I was looking. I've got to bring... I don't know if I have it, but I, I heard this word the other night in the middle of the night, and it was something about, it was different people's names, and I'll call them out when I get my other notebook with me, but there's one I did, I heard, and this is, I know it's a prophetic word because it don't make a, it's like a, a it's not clear on what it means, but it is a mystery. And I heard something about blinken and nod, blinken and nod, and it was something about. Uh, just keep that in your mind, blinken and nod. Hallelujah, man! You know, Krista was talking about asking, seeking, knocking. The three, you know, if you take ask. Uh, starts with an A, seeking starts with an S, knocking starts with a K. So any way you look at it, it's ask. Hallelujah. So it's a good, it's a good thing. You know, we've, we led people to Jesus earlier. We'll just do it again. Paul said, if you do this, says, if you believe in your heart, God raised Jesus from the dead and you confess with your mouth that he's your Lord, you'll be saved. So right now, wherever you are all over the world, why don't you just just right there, just lift your hands up and say, Lord Jesus, I believe in my heart God raised you from the dead. And I confess with my mouth that you are my Lord and Savior. And, and just ask him right now, say, live in my heart. Cleanse me from all sin. And from this point on, I'm following you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just ask him, say, take my life and do something with it. Amen. And then go ahead and get baptized in the Holy Ghost. Just ask him. You know, when you get saved, it's like the Holy Ghost baptizing you in Jesus. But when you get born again, now you have the Holy Ghost living in you. But now he needs to come up on you and anoint you for service. So now he's going to take, Jesus will take you and baptize you in the Holy Ghost in fire. Ask him to do that with the evidence of speaking into other tongues. Just say, Lord Jesus. Baptize me in the Holy Ghost and fire with the evidence of speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gives me utterance. And thank you for it, Lord. Just start thanking him now. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for baptizing me in the Holy Ghost. And then just start speaking this other language, whatever you hear. 
e riburia te casia le pele o roma gungele che a te paro se cosse le pungingele che a te rapale e vresio custe le pronto caha Hallelujah. And just keep doing it. You're speaking in mysteries. Mysteries. That's in God. And Satan has no idea what you're praying. It's actually the language that God and Adam spoke to one another in before Adam sinned. Amen. Amen. Now, I want to pray for some different people around the world right now and in this country in different places. Right now, I want you to stretch your hands out toward me and in the, just toward the screen wherever you are. And in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I rebuke cancer. I command cancer to leave your body. I command cancer to be obliterated in your body and go from you now in the name of Jesus. And we stand on Isaiah 53, 4 and 5. Surely he has bore your sickness and carried your pain. And with his stripes you are healed and made whole in Jesus' name. I call for a financial breakthrough to come forth in those lives listening to me right now. You need this financial miracle, this blessing. You heard that praise report, and you need that happening in your life. We call for that now, that the blessing of heaven come and rest upon your life in the name of Jesus. And I say be blessed. Be blessed. Be blessed in Jesus' name mighty name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, make a way where there is no way in the natural, but you make a way for them in Jesus' name. Lord, they are, are they're your people. They're our family, Lord. The 11th hour family, our partners. And Lord God, I thank you for them all. And Lord, I hold them up before you now in the name of Jesus that the anointing that's on this ministry will begin to rest on them also. And they can walk in the same anointing, the prophetic anointing, the teaching anointing, the preaching anointing, whatever they're, whatever's needed, pastoral anointing, the evangelistic anointing, whatever's needed. Lord, let them draw from it and show them the things to come. And I give you praise and honor and glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, it's been good to be with you today on the 11th hour, and we're going to be here again next Tuesday, so be sure and be with us, and uh, I want you to remember this. Never forget this, that Jesus loves you. He loves you so much. He stretched his arms out wide, as wide as they could pull them out, and he died for you. So he loves you. You can, don't ever say nobody loves me. He loves you, and we love you too. And never forget this, that God is absolutely good. Shalom and shalom.